Good morning, this is Professor Wham. And I decided I would go ahead and start doing this next batch of blogs. After finishing the material for the Utah UFO display, I realized that I'd have to make a really big effort and do a short series on my most favorite UFO book of all time, Project Identification, the First Scientific Field Study of UFO Phenomena by Harley Rutledge, Ph.D. It was published in 1981. And I consider this my favorite UFO book because of the, if you read it, you know, looking back at it now, when you read it now, you realize that Rutledge is right in the middle of something really, really important. But he himself does not always recognize the importance of what he's writing about, or at least he doesn't reveal it in his writing. And we'll get, we'll talk about this. There'll be many things that I'll just talk about, he observed, that those of us who are sort of in the know, that have been doing this for years, especially looking back retrospectively, will be like, oh, that's happening, that's happening. But he was really one of the first people to describe it um, and to describe the sequence of changes in his own life. So I, this study to me is so important that I'm going to devote three blogs to describing and going through the content. Um, in fact, I actually outlined each chapter to make sure that I could tell you some of the most important bits as I went along. This first installment will give an overview of project identification, a brief biography of Harley Rutledge, and some of the simple observations that got him started. Part two of the blog will actually cover the first phase of project identification, and part three will summarize phases two and three of project identification, including Rutledge's closing thoughts on the matter. So this is kind of an introduction, but we will get into what really got him into doing this study. Now, I am not alone in admiring this text and study. Gregory Little, who many know through his investigations linking North American paranormal and UFO experiences with sacred sites, has challenged present investigators to go out into the field with our new superior equipment and try to replicate at least some of what Rutledge attempted. There was a recent podcast that was done with Soraya, I believe, um, called Origins of the Gods with Gregory Little, um, and it was put up in, on September 24th, 2022, so it was just this last fall. And in that podcast, Little references the study by Rutledge. Um, and he has also referenced uh, Rutledge in several of his writings and a number of online essays. So he admires what this man did and acknowledges um, that his work is important and that it should be duplicated if we can. Now, before the project, project identification was even completed, David Jacobs, and we know who he was before he became an abduction junkie, he mentioned the study by name in his published dissertation project, The UFO Controversy in the United States, which was published in 1974. And this is significant from an academic perspective because um, David Jacobs' book was, which is kind of a history of the UFO narrative in the United States, and by itself is pretty good, especially for the time period, but it was his dissertation. It was a book version of his dissertation. And he published it in 74, and project identification only started in 73. So obviously, Jacobs had heard of it. And so he includes it in, his, in this book because he's a scholar at the time. He's an academic at the time, and, and he is talking about a fellow academic who is doing this work. Now, I will tell you that project identification was only printed once and never republished. So the fact that the, the price of this out-of-print copy or title has soared in recent years may be an indication of renewed interest. I purchased my copy about five years ago and paid $65 for it. Uh, now the lowest prices on Amazon are in the hundreds of dollars. So my recommendation would be to try to get it via interlibrary loan, which is actually how I first read it 
about 25 years ago and scan yourself a copy. I have no idea if it will ever be reprinted again. Um, for apparently Rutledge's family seems to be strictly disinterested. There have been some overtures to them that have been done by some researchers and they are strictly disinterested at this time. And in the current climate of crazy, I can see why, you know. Um, so my recommendation would be to try to get a scanned copy of it via interlibrary loan or something. Now, my principal contact in Pine Bush, New York, who assisted me in compiling the information for that paranormal mecca, reminded me of this book, Project Identification, during the writing process of my book, Mysterious Beauty. Um, he later sent me a collection of articles, news clippings, and presentations that had been assembled by a researcher named Susan Joy Renison about project identification in Harley Rutledge. She basically has gone through a lot of newspapers and, and other sources and has collected like an archive of information about him. So it is from those materials that I've assembled some of the biographical information which will be presented below. And I am entirely indebted to C. Burns, Ms. Renison, Scott Brown of Paranormal News, and the Minnesota chapter of MUFON for archiving some of Rutledge's work. There is also a summary description of project identification in the Time Life volume, The UFO Phenomenon, which some of you may be familiar with. I don't remember exactly you know, when that was published, but I, I think it was in the 70s or early 80s. There may also be identical, identical, there may also be additional information about Rutledge from other sources that I'm unaware of. So I don't consider these blogs to be definitive. My goal in presenting this to you is simply to provide information about project information and Harley Rutledge with the hope that someone somewhere will be willing to follow up on his good work. Now, Dr. Rutledge was trained in physics and had a good working knowledge of astronomy, electronics, optics, cameras, and film equipment, and this is very obvious in his text. By 1973, he had been working at Southeast Missouri State College in Cape Girardeau, Missouri for about a decade and had just become the chair of the department. He was a committed family man who also loved teaching and giving his family and students extra time and projects. The photo on the left is a photo that came out of this news archive that I was telling you about. And he's, it shows Harley in the field. He was a kind of a, a diminutive man. He wasn't very tall, very fit, sort of stocky. And uh, he's being interviewed here. And I can't remember exactly what the caption was in the newsprint. But the guy that he's being interviewed by would later go on to be a correspondent for CNN. So this, this represents this guy, the, the, even the, the reporter early on in his career. But here he, he, he is being interviewed in the field. And he, as the project went on, he did have to deal with publicity um, and the press off and on. And, and although he doesn't write about it a lot in the book, it's very clear that he was uncomfortable with this. He was very aware uh, that he, he needed to make sure his own approach to the topic um, it didn't embarrass the academic standing of the college. Uh, and so that's part of why I think probably his family doesn't really want to get involved in this either. On the right is a fairly well-known photo that is actually taken from the book, but it shows project identification in one of its later iterations, 19, 1978 specifically, um, he and a, a project team are setting up an observation post. Uh, the, the young man to the far left was his son, uh, Mark Rutledge, who as a result of his father's experience and even his own observations from their front yard became interested not only in observing uh, UFOs, but also just interested in astronomy and other things. I believe he went on to get a degree in the physical sciences. According to Rutledge's account, he had always harbored an interest in UFOs and had read the major books about them, 
both, both pro and con, including Kehoe, Jessup, Menzel, Class, you know, this is Philip Class, um, Richard Hall, and the Condon Report. Apparently, he had actually read the Condon Report, that massive tome, from cover to cover. He was curious about these accounts, but he was also skeptical, and he steered clear of contactee reports and the more sensational conspiratorial aspects of the UFO community. In fact, in the book, he'll mention some of that, but he just strictly doesn't talk about it very much. So when a flurry of UFO reports began to come in from Piedmont, Missouri, which is about 75 miles southwest of Cape Girardeau, and especially when the close UFO sighting of Piedmont basketball coach Reggie Bone and four of his players made local and the national news, Rutledge began to think about how he might organize and conduct a scientifically oriented field investigation. And this is one of the, the you know, one of the sensational newspaper reports that, that uh, was a local paper that um, featured Reggie Bone here on the left, uh, Maud Jeffries, who took some of, a couple of the more famous photographs of the Piedmont UFOs, and then Jean Coleman, who um, was known because she apparently saw I, if I remember correctly, she apparently saw a, 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 a lights come out of um, the lake. There, there's, a, there's a lake that is close to Piedmont. And she saw lakes, I mean, not lights come out of this lake. Now, at this point, I do need to say something about Reggie Bone. Reggie Bone was a beloved local figure who was known for his warmth, openness, and generosity. Six months prior to his UFO sighting, Bone was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease, a condition that forced his early retirement. That's ALS. That's what we call it now. Although city slicker reporters tended to portray him as bombastic in an attempt to sensationalize his sighting, which I'll discuss in more detail in a subsequent blog, apparently he was not known to exaggerate. Particularly poignant is the fact that the evening of the sighting, Bone was driving two team managers and three of his players home from a very important tournament, which they had lost by only seven points. So the UFO experience was very dramatic and shocking for them. And let me tell you, if you're, if you're in a small-town basketball team, small-town sports in the Midwest or in the South, these games are really important. So if you lose that close, it's a heartbreak. Now, also poignant is the fact that Reggie Bone died of his condition in 1977 at the age of 48, only four years after his UFO sighting and within the time frame of the later stages of project identification. The book Project Identification is actually dedicated to the memory of Mr. Bone. Now, I mention all this because in one of, in one um, podcast, not, not the Soraya podcast, but a podcast that was done maybe a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, um, done by po a podcaster several of us know, and that featured the Piedmont UFO flap of 1973, the two broadcasters spend almost 10 minutes making fun of Reggie Bone's name, implying that it had to be made up by journalists, perhaps because it reminded them of something suggestive. They act as if the man was just a meme for the sake of small-town jingoistic journalism. In fact, Bone had admonished the players not to say anything to anyone about the sighting, and it was their gossiping that broke the news, which Bone was then forced to confirm. This is the kind of irresponsible research and presentation that continues to give a bad name to many aspects of the paranormal. And by correcting this perception about Mr. Bone, I hope to show that Rutledge's research demonstrates that the Piedmont UFO flap wasn't just a bunch of rumors perpetuated by ignorant rural yokels, which is kind of what Dr. Hynek suggested, and it's also kind of what those podcasters suggested. No, Mr. Bone was an actual person who was suffering from a terminal condition at the time of his sighting and who was willing at a particular point in Rutledge's research to help in whatever way he could, despite his worsening health. 
So in his introduction to project identification the book, Rutledge describes what preceded his entry into the field to investigate the Piedmont outbreak. Now apparently there had been a small UFO flap in the Cape Girardeau area and across the river in Illinois in 1967. Cape Girardeau, or Cape as it's called locally, is right on the banks of the Mississippi and south of St. Louis, quite a little ways. Rutledge had paid little attention to this flap, although privately, some colleagues had told him about sightings that they had seen across the river in Illinois. In more recent years, the rumor about a possible UFO crash in, in Cape Girardeau in 1941 has begun to circulate in earnest. There's been a couple books written about it. But Rutledge doesn't mention this and probably didn't know anything about it. So I want to take a little bit of time here for those of you who are actually watching the podcast, not just listening to it. There's a map here that um, Rutledge includes in his text where, he, where you can actually see sort of a breakdown of the area. This is the whole area of what is called South Eastern uh, Missouri. Along the right side here to the east is the Mississippi River. And of course, Tennessee is over here and down. And Illinois is up here to the to the north uh, to the northeast and if and here's Cape Girardeau if you're looking um, and you can see that the Piedmont area he has circled here in a dotted circle and this area of the Piedmont runs right up against the eastern edge of the Ozarks and he'll mention at different times all of these different little towns Farmington, Fredericktown, Dexter, Chaffee. Um, you can see Sykeston is down here. Dexter is down here. This is important because I'll talk a little bit about this stuff later. There's Poplar Bluff, um, Ellesnore, Ella, Ellesnore, that's how you pronounce that, Mill Spring, Williamsville, Van Buren. Um, all of these are places where he ended up observing there were various sightings that came in from all of these different locations. Um, I will also talk a little bit later in the podcast about some of these locations where uh, Indian mounds are still found uh, because th those are a significant feature of this region. Sykeston, uh, Sykeston, Sykeston, right down here to the south, is uh, where there are some major um, Indian mounds. Uh, Dexter there are some major mounds there. There's a, another town that is further down along uh, uh, the Mississippi in this area, a little further south in this area called Lilburn, and they have a huge complex down there. Uh, and a little bit further south down here, right in this area here, if you see this little bend in the river right here, that's where New Madrid is. So this is also an earthquake region, a, a very major earthquake region. And if you follow I-55, which goes right by Cape Girardeau, um, it goes right up to St. Louis. Now this, this uh, highway here, Highway 55, also features importantly in many of the, uh, the UFO accounts. Um, and just so that you know, and I'll come back to it later, is that this particular highway is built along a, an, an old indigenous trade route that ran west of the Mississippi and that joined actually a lot of the different um, towns that were associated with some of these mound complexes and then later it became a colonial trade route and then later on after that it became an interstate and this is not uncommon uh, in, in these areas. So the Piedmont outbreak in March 1973 seemed much more widespread and persistent. Rutledge, who describes himself in this part of the book as a bit of an iconoclast, was persuaded that this might be a good time to put together a field study of the sightings. It was not the relatively good photo of what would become the classic Piedmont nocturnal light captured by Maude Jeffries that persuaded him. And in fact, you can, 
get online and actually see that. It's a, it's a very good exposure of one of the amber lights, but rather the sheer volume of reports, some by his own students, and one specific experience that we'll describe below that eventually moved him to organize project identification. But before getting started, Rutledge had to assemble a team equipped with scientific equipment, informed the college president that some college faculty were going into the field to study something that might bring notice and notoriety, and warned certain members of the press because he knew that eventually they were going to tag along. Rutledge also knew that he needed to find out if he could get any funding because he wanted the project to be an actual underwritten undertaking. After some concerted letter writing, he was able to persuade a St. Louis paper, the St. Louis Globe Democrat, to underwrite the project with the provision that Rutledge would have to present his findings at a scientific gathering and that, pay, that paper would have first dibs on whatever the results were. So while waiting on final word from his college president and funding possibilities, Rutledge decided to take a couple of colleagues to the Piedmont area and do a survey in order to talk to officials such as the police locate potential observation points, collect reports, and just get a sense of things. By his own admission, Rutledge did not necessarily expect to see anything himself. Now on the right uh, is a diagram of the kind of thing that he was thinking about. Um, even when he went on some of these early reconnaissance missions. Uh, what he wanted to do is set up several observation points. Um, because if you set up observation points with several observation points, at least two, but possibly three, with good equipment, you can actually create a situation where you can triangulate where the light or object is coming from and you, be, and you can calculate various things, like you can calculate um, speed and distance and size of the object, you know, especially once you know how far away it is, what the cloud um, ceiling is, things like that. Um, he wanted to be able to do this, and this is important because one of the individuals who was influenced by this approach was Ellen Crystal, who became famous uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s for being one of the uh, investigators of the Pine Bush lights. Now she was never able to do this in quite the same way that, that Rutledge did because she didn't have the same equipment um, and she was more interested in just taking photos and she was interested in Rutledge's photos. Uh, but so her approach wasn't quite as scientific as his, but um, the fact is, is that she was influenced by his desire to have several different stations where you could observe one object. And of course, then also by having several different stations, you have a number of witnesses who are seeing the object or the light from a number of vantage points. And this did actually prove to be useful because sometimes the light even though they were clearly seeing the same thing from time to time, um, they didn't often, it didn't appear to them the same way. So, so this is important. He was able to achieve this a couple of times during phase one of project uh, uh, identification. So on April 6, 1973, Rutledge took along a trusted colleague, a, pro a professor Ulicky, that's uh, you, you, no, not Ulicky, Ulek, Ulek, Ulek is how you pronounce his last name. It's, it's not, it, it's a name that looks like you, uh, ukulele, but it's not that, it's, it's Ulek. He took along, Ulek was another physicist on a scouting exposition to Piedmont. They set up an observation station with some simple but good equipment on Piles Mountain. Um, this is not the official name of this mountain. It's, it's what the mountain is called locally. And over the course of the evening witnessed five instances of potentially anomalous lights, lights that behaved very unusually. It was enough to pique Rutledge's interest and cause uh, Professor uh, Uelek some consternation. It made him very uncomfortable. 
Those initial sightings inspired Rutledge to begin assembling a team, which would include at least two other academic colleagues, graduate students, and other friends who had professional expertise that they could add, including a pilot, James Drake, who had access to a private plane that would enable Rutledge to potentially meet or pursue lights in the air, which is kind of a unique approach. Project members were limited to those individuals who either had training or degrees in the physical sciences, were conversant with observational techniques, and had enough mathematical skill that they could assist Rutledge in determining things like speed, size, and distance of any observed anomaly. It also helped if they knew how to use the varied equipment, such as cameras, um, often that had multiple shutter exposure times, telescopes of various powers and capabilities, and other recording devices. You have to remember the tech that was available at the time. Much of it was bulky and required actual manual adjustment. It didn't automatically adjust like a lot of the electronic stuff we have now. You had to actually manually adjust it um, or, or finesse it in order to get it to work. Rutledge also needed to get to know some of the personalities on the ground in Piedmont who might be able to spread the word because local observers might be needed as well. To that end, he connected with Tennis Hovis, a personality on the local radio station, other town officials, and police officers in Piedmont who would be willing to advise and help, and also to let them know what they were doing so that there would be no misunderstandings. Over time, members of the project would come and go. Rutledge's academic colleagues who first accompanied him, uh, as the professor I just mentioned, uh, Ulek, left early on in the process because they were uncomfortable with aspects of both the publicity and, frankly, with some of what they saw in the field. And, in fact, their, um, uh, Dennis Hovis went public at a certain point, uh, not, you know, as project identification was getting ready to take off, it went public uh, to the media with uh, a series of sightings that had occurred on April 13th, which was a Friday at the time, so it was Friday 13th, in which a number of, of individuals or colleagues that Rutledge had brought with him had seen some interesting things, um, but were trying to convince everybody that what they had seen was satellites, even though Rutledge in the book talks about this and explains that he was not he was not one of these physicists. He was the one that was demonstrating to his colleagues that it couldn't have been satellites because of this, 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 because the location of the satellites were known and it couldn't have been those. But anyway, um, so there was a little bit of a publicity buildup, if you will, to project identification getting started as well. Now, occasionally other colleagues would accompany Rutledge, as I mentioned, as time went on and as the focus of the phenomena changed. In the latter stages, Rutledge's son, sorry about that. that that's what you get when you get a homegrown um, podcast, right? I have limited editing ability on this, on the platform that I use. So we're just going to have to continue on despite that interruption. Um, we get like a thousand robocalls during the day here. Um, Rutledge's son, Mark, would become involved as a result of his own interest and observations. Rutledge's wife, Ruth, in a few instances also ended up helping out, and she had some of her own sightings eventually, completely independently of, of uh, her husband. Rutledge eventually went on to include local people and college students as observers who were willing to get some basic training in order to work with project members. Now, while the project collected accounts of non-project individuals in order to get a sense of context and location, no second-hand reports were included in the final project identification total. Only directly observed anomalies by project members were included in the final tally. Overall, the total project lasted seven years and encompassed three stages. Now, early on, the project team divided their sightings into three main categories. Sighted lights or objects were either identified or not. 
And the team identified many such sightings, not only for themselves, but for others. In fact, there's this whole section in the book where um, he talks about how he had to explain to people, no, this is Venus, this is, these are the stars of Gemini, um, etc. So he, he, there's this whole section where he talks about that, or, you know, people who are unfamiliar with the sky. Um, unidentified sightings were either Class B or Class A. In Class B sightings, the light or object looked unusual or couldn't be identified, but was too far away, or conditions were such, like fog, weather, topography, or other mundane lights, that it was impossible to determine whether it was truly anonymous. In Class A sightings, the light or object displayed very unusual characteristics that rendered it fantastic in some way, namely its behavior, its speed, its coloration, or shape. Um, or, as in the first example I will give you that finally convinced him to do this, um, the, uh, there are many different objects at once, and they're behaving oddly with each other. Now, Rutledge chose to ignore Dr. Hynek's famous UFO encounter classification, which had been published by this time. In fact, Dr. Hynek had visited Piedmont early on in the 1973 flap and decided that there wasn't much going on there. He sort of dissed the whole thing and poked fun at Mr. Bone in the process. He would not be the first widely known UFO personality to make this kind of mistake about aspects of the Piedmont display. So basically, Rutledge's dream goal was to set up various observation stations, as I noted, as I showed here, in areas of high incidence and attempt to observe the anomalies as they showed themselves from multiple angles and obviously many witnesses. He hoped the station members could stay in touch with each other via either walkie-talkie or radio, and with the combined data, various aspects of the object or light speed, distance, and size could be triangulated and calculated. He used the Questar telescope, which was a which is still a well-known telescope, but uh, was was very well known at the time. There are several models that they utilized, and it can calculate distance and speed of close objects, including satellites and conventional aircraft. And now the Questar telescope can actually look further out and calculate some of those things uh, in uh, th that are close to the moon and close to the close to the sun, uh, close to the Earth. The team also used various speeds of time-lapse photography and infrared cameras when they could get them. They had to be rented and checked out. Both black and white and color stock were used in order to render various contrasts, and voice recorders were employed to provide minute-by-minute -minute records of sightings in progress. Now, although there were some instances of equipment malfunction, it appears that often the objects or lights were not apparently actually close enough to them most of the time to directly impact the equipment, except for the radio, which they did have some problems with. And you have to remember that a lot of this equipment wasn't electric in the same way that ours is now, so there might have not been the same kinds of systems to affect in quite the same way. Rutledge indicates that there were many reports in Piedmont and Farmington, a neighboring town, of television disturbances when the lights were about, and he notes this is a common report of UFO displays generally. Now, as I mentioned, in the first week of project identification, the team actually sort of accomplished Rutledge's goal of triangulating certain sightings twice before snags began to present themselves. The major advantage that Rutledge had in his plan is that in most cases, the objects or lights are seen and or recorded by more than one person. And this leads to all kinds of interesting observations. Now, obviously, it is impossible for me in this format to go through every sighting because that's actually what this book is about. Um, Rutledge does go through virtually everything recorded, and he highlights the most extraordinary observations in meticulous detail with photos, charts, diagrams, and a complete rundown of all the technology used, as well as blow-by-blow -blow recitations of event sequence, namely, who reached for what instrument, when, and what happened then. Now, this recording became important because early on it became apparent to project members that the lights or objects were responding to what they were doing or even sometimes thinking and saying on the ground. Now, at first Rutledge saw this as a coincidence, but as such behavior became a pattern, 
it was clear that one could not just write this phenomenon off that way. So those responses are also data points, and he begins to include them. Rutledge interrogates himself constantly about the, the issue of coincidence throughout the book. So before going through the best early sightings during the expedition phase of project identification, um, and <clears throat> I'm just going to go through one basic one, let me just provide a summary of what the team collected and provide some additional historical context. So this is towards the end of the book. This is a summation of what they collected. Over a seven-year period from 1973 to 1980, project identification set up a total of 158 viewing stations. The sky was watched for a total of 427 hours, each station observing on average about 2.7 hours per watch. There were 620 total observers, of which 378 were official project members. This included one of the deans of Southeast Missouri State College. By the end of the project, over 700 still photos and an undetermined amount of film was taken by project members and local observers. It's not clear how much of this has been archived. During that period, there were a total of 157 sightings of 178 unidentified objects or lights, most were lights. In these sightings, 34 are listed as Class A. In his statistics of Class B sightings, Rutledge tentatively identifies 40 sightings of 42 UFOs as potential conventional aircraft that, due to conditions, they could not eliminate entirely from the unknown category. That obviously leaves many Class B sightings. Along the way, Rutledge and his team also observed other phenomena that are often associated with UFOs, but which are not always discussed in the popular literature. Although, if one has actually talked to people in the field or has been in the field oneself, these phenomena are known and have been observed in other locations. Now, I don't know whether Rutledge and project members actually developed the names for these phenomena themselves, but it is through this text and the usage of these terms by f individuals familiar with his work, mostly in Pine Bush, that I came to understand to what these terms were referring. One such term is strobe, which is used by Rutledge to describe flash a flashing light or lights that seem to emanate either from the ground or the sky in repetitive patterns, like strobes, except that there is no discernible source for the lights. A variation of this is what he calls the flashlight effect, when the light seems to come from a discrete aerial light or said light begins to flash on and off. The strobes would be like lightning, except there is no charge, channel, or strike, and they often seem to engage in what can almost be referred to as a call and response pattern, like a conversation. Strobes can also be various colors, white, yellow, or in one instance red, they are not always associated with weather. Um, strobes can happen in clear skies. So strobes are not the same as the nocturnal lights, but they often signal their eventual appearance. Another term is pseudostar, a curious phenomenon that had to be described to me before I realized that I've actually had this experience myself a couple of times, but I'm not going to go into those here. Essentially, a pseudostar is a light that seems to present as part of a constellation or a planet. It might even be flickering in the same way as a star. The problem is, if you know the constellation or you know what planets are in the sky at the time, you'll realize that you've never seen that star or planet before, or you'll wonder how you could have missed it. It will often mimic the same magnitude as the stars in the constellation, at least as seen from your vantage point. At some point, the pseudostar will suddenly brighten, change color, get larger, or begin moving in ways that make it clear it is not a star in the heavens, but something much closer to you that is mimicking a star. In the instances when project members could get their telescopes trained on pseudostars, they could clearly see a fast-moving, directed light revolving or changing colors rapidly, thus seemed to make this is what seemed to make the light twinkle from the ground. In some ways, pseudostars were even more unnerving to project members than closer lights, since they implied that, quote, they knew where to sit in the sky to get noticed and could tell 
when observers were present. Now, as mentioned, most, unidenti most unidentified lights or objects were simply lights, although there were instances when the lights appeared to be connected to much larger or stranger objects that, except for the lights, were mostly unseen, and we'll talk about these in subsequent blogs. Triangular formations of lights were occasionally observed, and in some few instances, physical seeming objects of disk shape or very unusual configuration were seen during daylight hours, including a bullet-shaped object that Rutledge saw that really disturbed him. Now, all in all, for those of us who are familiar with these accounts, the types of lights and phenomena that Rutledge reports are very similar to those found in other places where UFO displays are common, such as in Pine Bush, New York, as I've mentioned, or the Pocono region of Pennsylvania. Now, this is, in fact, the reason why I used information from project identification when providing context and background for the, for the chapter on Pine Bush, New York, in my book, Mysterious Beauty Living with the Paranormal in the Hudson Valley. Rutledge also provides a little bit of history for the region and indicates that during the course of project identification, there were, there were reports of Bigfoot and cattle rustling or mutilations in the larger Piedmont Clearwater Lake area, as well as more complex UFO encounter reports, which included occupants, contact, and possible abduction. While Rutledge makes note of these accounts, project members don't go investigate them so as not to get off track. Now, for those interested in pursuing possible links, between the Piedmont area and prehistoric sites, there is some history to guide you and to consider. Um, and I mentioned the I-55 corridor from Piedmont, um, from St. Louis to going down the southern edge, the eastern edge of Mississippi. But there's also um, the highways that link the Piedmont area to, Lake, to Cape Girardeau. And in fact, most of these um, highways, these state highways here, were originally old um, indigenous trade routes. And what you have to remember is that St. Louis itself uh, was the site of Cahokia, um, pro the largest city um, in North America that existed probably around the early 13th century. This whole region here is also referred to as the Lead Belt because both indigenous people and later settlers mined the local lead deposits for varying reasons. As I've also member, uh, mentioned, there are a number of Hopewell and Mississippian mound sites in the area. And here are, for those of you who are looking at the blog, here is an area in Lilburn uh, where they're actually excavating a, a, a series of mounds. The University of Missouri is doing this. You notice that one of the mounds um, oversees what is currently a, uh, a regular cemetery. Um, this, this particular mound compl complex um, is, um, is fairly well known because some really, really good uh, artifacts have been found in it. Um, this particular site, which I'll include the link of in, in the places where it needs to be put, um, it, it gives you a good rundown of everything that they have found at this site, archaeologically. You'll also notice here that this particular um, website has been updated. At one point, it included a drawing or photos of skeletal remains, and they have obviously removed those um, out of respect for indigenous concerns. And this is another website, which I'll also include, that, in, that includes some information about the, um, the mounds that are around New Madrid and Dexter. Uh, but the important thing about this is this little insert map here, which uh, illustrates graphically the, the number of native settlements in southeast Missouri. And you'll see they're massive, massive. These are all the places where um, archaeological remains of, of uh, indigenous people have been found. And you can see that this area around New Madrid was heavily settled. Um, both the Hopewell civilizations and the Mississippian civilizations um, had large complexes here. So, and it was very populated at different times. So um, there's, there's a lot of history in this region. It isn't just a rural area for Hicks. European settlers in the Ozarks, 
and the Ozarks, then uh, Piedmont, like I said, is on the eastern edge of the Ozarks. So if you continue to go west, um, if you can continue to go west, then you'll go into the Ozarks. Um, in later periods, the Osage Nation occupied the Ozarks. Um, if you go if from Missouri down into Arkansas, you'll get what are called the Southern Ozarks, the same mountain range. They're called the Blue Mountains there. But European settlers into the Ozarks included many Scottish immigrants who desired to live in more isolated settings and often uh, were relocating there from the, um, the Smoky Mountains. They brought many of their traditional practices and beliefs with them. As paranormal investigator Eugenia Macer's story discovered, while exploring the roots of her own Scottish heritage. And in fact, in some of her later writings, she goes into some detail about this. It is also important to remember that Missouri was originally a slave state, a Southern slave state. So that aspect of culture exists as well. Uh, Missouri became a state in 1819 as part of what was called the Missouri Compromise. Um, Maine and Missouri were both territories that wanted to be, um, that wanted to come into the Union the question of slavery emerged because um, many, many people in Congress did not want slavery to extend to new territories. They wanted slavery to be limited to the places where it had been. But obviously, slave states were, they wanted to expand slavery. They wanted slavery to continue. And so what the Missouri Compromise was what, what the decision was, and it would have fateful consequences later, is that both Maine and Missouri would be admitted into the Union, and that um, basically um, they would they would alternate which states got be, became slave and which did not. So Maine came in as a non-slave or free state. Missouri was the only state came in as a slave state, and it was also part of the compromise was the agreement that it would be the only state above the Mason-Dixon line um, that would be a slave state. This would cause terrible problems later because Missouri fought in its own small version of the Civil War, which actually began in 1854 as a result of the Kansas-Nebraska Territorial Compromise, which is something later. Now, these Ozark Mountains provided means of escape for fugitives, fleeing slaves as part of the Underground Railroad, and shelter for those who desired to flee the Civil War altogether. If you recall, Mark Twain, um, who lived in Hannibal, which is up towards um, St. Louis, it's north of this area, actually fled the state entirely in his youth to avoid fighting on either side. As the Civil War conflict began here, it, so it also dragged on here, long after the official guns were silenced, which is what the Clint Eastwood movie, Outlaw Josie Wales, is actually about, if you know that movie. As a result, there are many places in Missouri which one could safely say are haunted, 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 and Rutledge does briefly mention this level of cultural folklore as a backdrop to the Piedmont UFO outbreak. So he was aware of all of that. So now, as mentioned, Rutledge went on several exploratory expeditions from April to mid-May of 1973 in order to provide scope for any field study. However, the sighting that cinched the importance of and the need for project identification for Rutledge was his lengthy observation on April 11th, 1973, of a total of 10 amber and white objects moving, blinking on and off, and clearly reacting to him and the plane during an overview flight with James Drake in that Cessna. Rutledge's detailed and diagrammed account, which is almost a chapter in length, was so astonishing and disturbing to him that he was convinced a full-fledged study needed to be done. And this is actually the diagram taken from his book. Basically, what, ended, what, what, what he's looking at this through binoculars, and he's up in the air. So basically what happens is that he sees this one light, and this is indicated by one. He sees this one light come on, and then he sees another light come on, and then he sees a whole range of lights come on, 
and they they interact with him, and then he sees a fourth light come on. And I'll just read a little bit from his text. This is actually on page 43. He says, um, In my binocular view of seven degrees, the two lights were separated, and these are the first two lights, one and two, by six degrees. The first light was in the upper left of the binocular field, and the second in the lower right. I continued the observation for another ten seconds or so while the lights took turns pulsing. They were pulsing alternately. First one would pulse three or four times, then the other would seem to answer. In any event, the pulsations of the light had no meaning to me. Surely, I thought, this is not some simple form of communication. Suddenly, to my amazement, a row of seven lights came on in my field of view. While continuing to observe, I informed the others. James had, they had other observers in, in their, their plane. Where, where, Jim shouted above the engine noise. The others began to shout as well. At the moment the row appeared, I thought, that's not the Air Force. Then it hit me. Many of the stories dating from World War II might have a basis. A great wave of excitement overwhelmed me. Never had I experienced such acceleration. UFOs really exist, and I was an eyewitness. But soon the scientist in me made me begin to be more critical of the scene unfolding in front of me. I needed to gather all the information possible from this unexpected and incredible event. There were nine lights in all. The first individual light I had seen remained stationary in the upper left portion of the binocular field. The, the second individual light was still in the lower right portion. They were no longer pulsating. The horizontal row of seven lights was centered between and somewhat above the two individual lights, but was not perpendicular to my line of sight. Instead, the row slanted away from me, from right to left. The seven lights in the row were not identical. The three adjacent lights on the right end appeared to be closer and were each surrounded by a peculiar, dark, cloud-like, shimmering haze. The density of the haze decreased outward from each light at its center. Occasional smaller lights streaked out of the central source of light, but they never reached the periphery of the haze. The appearance of each of the three lights reminded me of the burnout effect one gets on a television screen when a television camera is aimed at a bright light source. The other four lights were further away and seemed to twinkle and jiggle in position. I could see the broad blue sky between the four lights, and while the spheres of dark haze surrounded the first three lights, almost touched their peripheries. The first three lights were somewhat brighter than the last four, matching in brightness the two individual lights seen first. Had the haze effect been a physiological response of my eyes to the bright lights, the effect would have been confined to the two individual lights seen first, as well as to the first three lights in the row. In my opinion, I was observing an actual physical phenomenon. And then later on, and he, he talks about this for some degree, and then, and, it just, and then as he gets the other people to try to, to see what he's seeing, this fourth light or this last light comes on uh, before, uh, and they actually attempt to pursue it. And then eventually everything disappears. So this is the end of part one. Parts two and three of this blog will go into phases one, two, and three of project identification in more detail. But for now, we'll close with the final disposition of Rutledge's study. Now, once project identification was closed in 1980 and the book published in 1981, Rutledge made little public effort to continue this work after fulfilling his contractual obligations to the St. Louis paper, which included him um, giving a report of this to a regional a scientific organization. Although there is evidence that he kept up his observations privately. In 1986, Rutledge spoke at a MUFON symposium, and I believe this was the only time he did so, and he said the following. This is a quote. At the moment, I personally have seen 160 UFOs, 42 of them directly from my yard or close to home. I've seen seven ships or physical objects, including two discoid apparatus. One of the disks I have watched in broad daylight from my office in Southeast University, this is Southeast Missouri State College. In four cases out of seven, 
there were from one to three witnesses that can confirm that I have not imagined anything. I am often asked, why do you see so many UFOs? It is rather not a question, but an accusation. The fact is, I don't sit in a chair but work in the field, spending hours and days in the place of UFO activity. This work is comparable to waiting for a meteorologist who wants to see a tornado, or an astronomer waiting for a new comet. No matter how much equipment and people at your disposal, night after night you get nothing until there arises a subject of research. I've seen everything except the little men, but I still have no definitive hypothesis about the nature of the phenomenon." Unquote. In 1992, at the age of 66, Rutledge had to retire from teaching due to health reasons. After he left, a new dean removed all references from UFOs or the project identification study from official college documentation, and no further inquiries into the subject were entertained. Rutledge died in 2006 at the age of 80, having never realized his dream of having a full UFO study undertaken by a reputable academic institution. So this is the end of part one, project identification.